Well, hi, I'm, I'm Ted Perrin. I'm an internal medicine physician. I'm one of the medical directors at uh, Glen Bay uh, Chemical Dependency Treatment Programs here in Ashtabula. And I'm also a faculty member at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, where I teach medical students about addiction medicine, about um, the doctor-patient relationship, about medical ethics, and professionalism. And I, I guess I'm here today to talk with you all a little bit about the, the addicted brain, what happens to the addictive brain from a brain chemistry standpoint once the disease of addiction starts to happen, as well as several related topics to that. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly amazing thing, but about one out of eight to one out of 10 Ohioans is born with or develops a brain that can develop addiction. Probably seven out of eight Ohioans, no matter what they do, they can't develop alcoholism or drug addiction, no matter what they do. But about one out of eight has a brain which, as I said, is either genetically or environmentally primed to develop addictive behaviors. Those genetically primed addictive brains have a different response. If you have addiction in your brain, your brain has a very different response to the introduction of alcohol, uh, marijuana, uh, opiates, uh, cocaine, or amphetamines. The addicted brain, when it experiences those so-called euphoria-producing drugs, from alcohol to marijuana to opiates to amphetamines, when it experiences those drugs, it has a completely different response than the non-addicted brain. Seven out of 10 Ohioans and Americans can use alcohol, or even experiment with drugs, and never have a second thought about it, never have to try to control it, and really never be concerned about it. One out of eight Ohioans, if they experiment with alcohol or other drugs, they immediately need to try to control their use, and they still lose control. They get out of control, and they have terrible consequences in their life. The consequences that happen to a person with an addictive brain, the sorts of problems or adverse consequences that happen to a person with, with addiction start initially in the area of their life called self-concept, judgment, sense of self-control, um, and really honestly sense of self-worth. The first area of life where a person with addiction begins to suffer is in their self-concept and sense of self-worth. They begin to promise themselves they're not going to do these, these irresponsible and atypical things again. And as long as they're using any alcohol or any drugs, they do it again and again and again. So that's the first domain. The second area of life where people with addiction develop uh, ongoing problems is in their close love relationships, their relationships with their family, with their spouse, with their children, and with very close significant others. The difference between being your best as you can be in America and being so bad at it that your teacher or your boss thinks there's something wrong is a huge difference. But the difference between being the best you can be as a spouse or as a parent or as a close loved one and being so poor at that relationship that your significant other starts saying, what the heck's wrong with dad or my spouse is very narrow. So the second area of life where people really develop major problems is in close love relationships. The third is in social relationships because, you know, Americans tend to socialize with alcohol, with beer or wine or liquor or whatever. And if you have addiction and people are socializing and they're using anything at all, um, it causes you all kinds of problems. Um, the fourth tends to be financial because when you lose control of your behavior, money gets really funny. And before you know it, you never have enough and you're always in trouble with it. The fifth is legal. The second to last, the sixth area that people develop problems in is school or work. Whereas most families think, oh my gosh, you know, he's still got a job, she's still got a job, 
her grades are still okay, there can't be a problem. That's the second to last thing to go. And the last thing to go is physical problems. Um, if you wait for a person with a drinking problem to develop liver disease, it's often been 10 to 20 years of a drinking problem. They're often working on their second or third marriage before their liver starts to suffer. And so the so-called natural history of addiction uh, involves pain and suffering on the part of the person with addiction, that one out of eight Americans, pain and suffering in their self-image and self-respect, then close love relationships, then social relationships, then money, then legal problems, then job, and then finally their health and their and developing medical problems. Addictive disease is one of those diseases which tends to start out slowly. People begin to lose control over their use of alcohol and other drugs and it begins to cause chemical changes in their brain. They begin to look forward to the high or to the drunk or to the euphoria even more than they look forward to things they love doing in life, like their hobbies um, or their close love relationships. And that's because of actual chemical changes in the brain that the alcohol and drugs produce. And so as these brain changes continue, people develop a stronger and stronger love relationship, if you will, with using at the expense of all the other important relationships in their life. And that's purely based on brain chemistry. As this relationship with using gets stronger, when people aren't using, they begin to think about using, they begin to crave using, they begin to yearn uh, for the times when they're using. And so even when they're not using, they're sort of distracted. Uh, they have night dreams about using, they have daydreams about using, and they're sort of not invested in the rest of their life because they've got this, this sick, sort of pathologic significant other or lover in their life called using, which is constantly picking with them uh, during the day. So they tend to get more and more irritable. They tend to get less and less tolerant of other people. And they tend to hang around with people who use like they do. They tend to spend more and more time with people who use like they do in a um, dangerous, non-normal, sort of pathologic way. And they spend less and less time hanging around people who are social users or people who don't use. And so because of brain chemistry changes, you see people making day in and day out changes in their peer group, um, where they're hanging around people, places, and things um, associated with heavy use. And they spend less and less time with people, places, and things associated with more normal behavior in their life. And all of that is based on brain changes. One of the dangerous things about the brain chemistry changes of addiction is that when a person with addiction stops using and they go through detox or they go through withdrawal, when they're done with detox or withdrawal, their brain is still nowhere near normal. It takes a minimum of three to six months for a person who's not using for their brain to begin to get back towards normal. And that's why 60% of relapses take place in the first three months. 80% of relapses take place in the first six months because it takes a minimum of three to six months for the brain to start getting back towards normal. So the highest risk period for a person with addiction is that first three to six months. The next highest risk period is the following six months till they get to a year sober. <clears throat> and then finally, once a person's been sober for two years and they're still going to some meetings and have a sponsor and have a home group and have integrated a sobriety program in their life, once they've been sober two years, they've got about a 90% chance of never having a relapse again the rest of their life. As long as no one starts them on an addiction, addictive prescription 
Um, or as long as there isn't like a death in the family or one of their children, you know, has a problem or, or, uh, or a mental health problem flares up in their life. Those are the typical things that can precipitate relapses late. But most folks, if they can make it two years sober and they have a sobriety program integrated into their daily life, um, they've got a very good chance of, of not being faced with relapse in the future. Whereas in the first three to six months, uh, people tend to be faced with all kinds of relapse problems. So from an addiction brain chemistry standpoint, people with addictive disease, the one out of eight Americans who has a potential for addiction, they're either born with a brain that has different chemistry or they're involved in an environment that changes their chemistry in their brain so that when they're exposed to alcohol and other drugs, the alcohol and other drugs actually take over their, their behaviors and their brain in an addictive way. Um, as opposed to everyone else who uses a little bit, decides whether they like it or not, and never has to think twice about trying to control it. There's another issue that often comes up is questions from family members or friends. Um, they see a person beginning to develop some of these addictive behaviors, losing their sense of self-worth, um, beginning to behave in erratic and, and, uh, and irresponsible and unpredictable ways when they're drinking or drugging, and then behaving in their same normal, typical, you know, good ways um, when they're not drinking or drugging. So friends or family members begin to see this behavior and they often wonder, what can I do? Um, uh, it's heading the wrong way. When this person is using, they are a different person. And when they're not using, they're their same usual person who we've always known and loved. How can we intervene? And the advice that I give to friends or family members are really three things. And it depends on what the, what the friends or family members feel capable of doing. One is to talk to the person and to say, look, it's not you. It's the using. Separating the humanity of the soul, the, separating the person from the behaviors of the disease. And saying to them, look, it's not you. It's the using. You need to do something about your using. You need some help. You need some treatment. As opposed to saying, how could you do this uh, to me and to the family, which joins the person and the using. So what you want to do when you talk with a person is to separate the person from the using and say that the using is unacceptable and the behaviors that come with it. But you're the same good person that God made in the first place. And, um, and with help and with treatment, you can become the same good person that you ever were. And so that's one approach that families can do. A second approach that families can do is to get some help for themselves, uh, either by going to some meetings or by reading. And there's a group called Al-Anon, not Alcoholics Anonymous, but al hyphen anon, which are groups in the community specifically developed for friends or family members of a person who has addiction to help those friends and family members stay more healthy themselves while they're, you know, involved with this person with addictive disease. And so Al-Anon meetings are often very, very helpful. Now many people feel too nervous or to feel too embarrassed to go to a meeting, just to kind of wander into a meeting. So before going to a meeting, it can be very helpful to read some books. Uh, one book, which is the single best book I've ever found, and I've been treating addictive disease since 1985. The single best book I've ever found for friends or family members is a book written by Rogers and Macmillan. In, and it's, it's titled, Freeing Someone You Love from Alcohol and Other Drugs. It's available, you know, in libraries and, and, you know, on Amazon and maybe in bookstores still, although it's been around for a long time. Freeing Someone You Love from Alcohol and Other Drugs is a really useful book for friends or family members of a person who has an addiction problem. Another series of books is entitled Getting Them Sober, uh, Volume 1, 2, and 3. There's several volumes, um, but Getting Them Sober, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 can be helpful as well, but I really strongly recommend 
Freeing Someone You Love from Alcohol and Other Drugs by Rogers and Macmillan as a, as a great introduction to learning about this disease from the perspective of a friend or family member and learning what a person can do to try to help themselves and to try to help the person with the disease. Often reading that book is all that's necessary for a person to feel comfortable enough to start going to some meetings and getting some help. The third thing that friends or family members can do, which is the most intensive, is, um, is to try to do an intervention, to try to do a family intervention or a crisis intervention. Very much like those intervention TV shows, you know, that are on cable uh, somewhere or another. I've never watched them because I've sat through a lot of interventions myself as a doctor helping to do them. And so I can't stand to watch them on TV. Um, but the interventions are a little bit like the interventions on those uh, intervention shows on TV. In order to do an intervention, you want a specialist. You want to contact a, a certified drug and alcohol treatment program and find out from them who on their staff is an interventionist, is trained on how to do interventions. And you want to work with a trained counselor, social worker, psychologist, or somebody on the staff who's a trained interventionist to do interventions. <clears throat> so for friends or family members who see one of your loved ones beginning to spend more and more time using, beginning to, to behave and act like a totally different person when they're using than when they're not, begin to use in ways that are stressing their own self-respect, their self-image, their sense of self-concept, and their using is beginning to strain their relationship with you. If you begin to see that, you are looking at addiction. That's all there is to it. And there's three options. Uh, one is just to tell the person in a caring way, it's not you, it's the using. You need to do something about the using and get treatment. So that's a way to do your own sort of intervention. A second thing is to go to some meetings or read some books to help you deal with this in a more healthy way for yourself. Going to Al-Anon meetings or reading um, freeing someone you love from alcohol and other drugs, or reading one of the Getting Them Sober books. And the third thing you can do is to actually reach out to a, to a certified drug and alcohol treatment program and work with a counselor who's an interventionist to help you and other concerned family members intervene with the person. It's critically important to remember as a friend or family member that when a person stops using they're going to crave the using like crazy. The brain changes haven't gone away and they don't go away for three to six months. So supporting that person in going to their groups, going to their meetings, having a sponsor, having a home group, going to the outpatient counseling programs or the residential counseling programs, keeping alcohol and drugs away from them in the home so they have a, they have a dry, supportive home to live in. Um, it's essential to do those sorts of things for the first three to six months, remembering that 60 to 80 percent of relapses take place in the first three to six months. And relapses are really dangerous. Um, so that's really, that's the message for friends or family members, um, uh, for anyone who has an addiction history or has had, a, had an issue with addiction. I'm often asked by friends or family members um, about how they, as a loved one of a person with addiction, can interact with perhaps a, a Department of, of Children and Family Services worker, or how can they, as a friend or family member, interact with a probation officer, or how can they interact with a, with a um, drug or alcohol treatment provider, how can they interact with a primary care doctor or a family doctor who's taking care of their significant other. And that can be challenging because if, a, if as a friend or family member you just call up a treatment program or child protective services or a probation officer or a, or a primary care treatment uh, or a primary care provider or a drug treatment program, you're faced with what's called HIPAA the Health Information Portability Act, which basically says that they're not allowed to talk with you. 
But that doesn't mean they're not allowed to receive information from you. They're just not allowed to talk to you. They're not allowed to share information with you. They're not even allowed to say that your loved one is seeing them for probation or for child protective services or for treatment um, or for medical care. They're not allowed to, to acknowledge the person's a patient and they're not allowed to share any information with you. But you can share any information you want with them. So what I recommend is this. You call up and you just say, what's your fax number? Or what's your address, your mailing address? Um, I have some information I need to mail to your office. And this works for probation, for Children Protective Services, for a medical provider, a psychiatric provider, or an addiction treatment provider. You just call up and say, what's your fax number and or what's your address? And then you, as a concerned significant other of the person with addiction, just write down everything you know about their addiction and about their sobriety program how well they're doing with their sobriety, whether they're going to their meetings, whether they're sneaking a little bit on the weekends, whether they're going to see other providers, whether they're diverting some of their medicine in order to buy some substances, whether they've had treatment before and so please don't put them back on these addictive drugs. Whatever it is you want to tell that provider, write it out and fax it to their office. And as long as you identify who the patient is, or the probationer, or the client is, the person who receives that information is required by law to include your fax or your letter in their medical record. And they're required to take that information that you've provided and factor that into their decisions about how to, how to manage that person. So if you see a person who's doing great in recovery, and you want their outpatient counselor to know they're doing great in recovery, but you can't get that outpatient counselor to even acknowledge over the phone that the person's a patient of theirs, even though you drop them off every day at the treatment program. All you have to do is call that treatment program and say, what's your fax number? Um, or what's your address? And send them a note saying, let me tell you how this person is working in recovery. If, on the other hand, you see your loved one who was doing really well for three months or so, and now it starts looking like their wheels are falling off their apple cart. They're stopping going to meetings. They're getting weird phone calls again. Their behavior is starting to look a little bit funny. You can write that down and send it in to uh, the treatment program or the probation officer or whoever. Fax it in or send it in. And finally, if you have a loved one who's had a problem with prescription drugs ever in their life, who's either sold prescription drugs or who when they get prescription drugs they overtake them and kind of party or binge on them and then run out early, um, or heaven forbid a person who was addicted to prescription drugs, any time they get a new health care provider, whether it's a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, a physician, uh, or a psychiatrist. Anytime they get a new health care provider, feel free to write up a note saying this is what their history is. If you contact their previous doctors and nurses and such, you'll find out and let me give you their names and addresses and just fax it right into the new health care provider. What you're doing that way is you are increasing the odds that a person stays sober, which means that they get what they deserve which is to be a predictable, responsible uh, person who you love. You increase the chances they stay sober and you decrease the chances that they relapse. So those are the sorts of things that we talk with friends and family members about all the time uh, in terms of how to interact with a person with addiction. Many people have asked in the past, especially prescribers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, medical students who are thinking about prescribing, or residents who are being trained on how to prescribe, or even, you know, busy medical doctors or psychiatric doctors, you know, uh, like myself who've been at this for a long time. Many people wonder, how, how, what can I do as a prescriber?
to minimize the chance that I am prescribing addictive drugs to a person who has a substance abuse problem. And there's several very simple procedures to put into one's practice. Number one, before prescribing long-term addictive drugs, which means before prescribing long-term medicines for ADD or ADHD, for insomnia, for pain, or for anxiety, before prescribing any long-term controlled drugs, it's critically important to screen for addiction. Screening for addiction involves asking the patient the audit, the alcohol use disorder interview tool. Asking two or three friends or family members the family cage questionnaire about the patient, which means having the patient sign a release of information form so that you can contact friends or family members. Asking the previous prescribers how the person behaved around these kinds of prescriptions in the past. Doing a toxicology test. Any clinician, whether you're a pediatrician or a family physician or an internal medicine doc like myself or a psychiatrist, any prescriber who prescribes long-term controlled drugs, controlled drugs for longer than a matter of several days to a few weeks, and doesn't check a tox screen, is like practicing medicine and taking care of diabetes without checking blood sugars or a hemoglobin A1C. It's inconceivable in 2017, 2018, it's inconceivable since 2007 when accidental fatal overdose on prescription controlled drugs became the leading cause of death in Ohio, the leading cause of accidental death. It's inconceivable to do long-term controlled drug prescribing without checking tox screens. And it's contrary to medical board rules to prescribe long-term controlled drugs without checking an ORS report. We are required by medical board rules to check an ORS report when prescribing controlled drugs, especially long-term, and to check them at least every three months, if not every visit. Um, just to make sure a person's not going to several other doctors. So it's not very hard to screen for addictive disease. Number one, ask the patient the audit, the alcohol use disorder interview tool. Number two, ask the family cage of friends or family members of the patient. Number three, ask the previous prescriber how the patient behaved around their controlled drug prescriptions. Number four, do some tox testing at the beginning and intermittently every three to six months while you're prescribing. And then finally, number five, check an ORS report. And check the ORS report as often as the medical board tells us to do it. If the medical board says check it every visit, check it every visit. If they say check it before prescribing and then once every three months, then do it that often. But keep track of the medical board rules because they have continued to evolve over the last five years or so. Um, and be sure to follow medical board rules. If you find a patient with a history of addictive disease based on your screening, treat them without a DEA number. The bottom line is the Hippocratic Oath, which is the primary guiding ethical principle of the practice of medicine, says above all first do no harm and then comfort always and cure sometimes. But first do no harm. Prescribing potentially addictive drugs to a person who you know has an addictive brain endangers the health, the safety, the liberty, and potentially the life of that patient. It's not possible to come up with a legitimate medical purpose to endanger the health, the safety, the liberty, and potentially the life of a patient. No matter what their MRI scan looks like and no matter how bad their PTSD or their insomnia is, whatever we might prescribe controlled drugs for, pain, anxiety, insomnia, ADD, narcolepsy, whatever it is, whatever we might prescribe controlled drugs for, there are legitimate and appropriate non-controlled drug alternatives that are safe 
for a person who has addiction in their brain. So controlled drugs are very safe drugs to prescribe to the seven out of eight Americans who don't have addiction. But they're exceedingly dangerous to prescribe to the one out of eight Americans who does have addiction. And ongoing prescribing, long-term prescribing of controlled drugs to people with a history of addiction just doesn't have a place in the usual course of medical practice for a legitimate medical purpose. And from a federal law standpoint, those are the two criteria. If, if heaven forbid any of us, me or you, are ever asked to justify our prescribing of medications to this patient in front of us at a federal level, what we're asked is, show us that the prescribing took place in the usual course of medical practice and for a legitimate medical purpose. And there isn't one uh, when it comes to long-term prescribing of controlled drugs to people with addiction. Short-term prescribing for a brief period of time, if there's a sprain or a strain or an accident or an injury or a knee replacement or whatever, might be necessary. But long-term prescribing, there is not a, a, a legitimate medical purpose and it's inconsistent with the usual course of medical practice.